Welcome to this presentation of the life of St. Edmund. I'm Father Dick Mahalik. I'm also known as Father Richard by some. We're here today to talk uh, a little bit about the life of St. Edmund. And as I reflect upon it, I discover uh, he's known by a number of different names. When you Google his name, you'll find him. Uh, if you just put in St. Edmund, you're going you're gonna to find uh, it gives you a whole bunch of choices. You can find him as St. Edmund of Abington. He was born there. You can find him as St. Edmund of Canterbury because he was the 40th Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, but you can also find him as, uh, surprisingly, St. Edmund of Pontigny, which is in France, because that is his final resting place. So a little bit about uh, Edmund over the years and the story to be told. First of all, it might uh, fascinate some because canonization is a process that we've had for a number of years that the present canonization process really didn't start until the 13th century. And uh, the very first person to be uh, canonically recognized as a saint was St. Francis of Assisi in the year 1228. And shortly after his canonization, uh, St. Dominic was the second. And the third, uh, only six years after his death, is St. Edmund of Canterbury. And what's noteworthy is to see how Edmund's life reflects both um, St. Francis's uh, concern and love for the poor, as well as Dominic's extraordinary uh, union between the faith and knowledge and his preaching ability. Um, when you go to Google and you search for Edmund, you'll also discover that there was another Edmund who was a saint, and that is St. Edmund the King. And he was martyred as a king of England in the year 869. Um, what I find rather fascinating is the connection between the two Edmunds. Uh, Edmund of Canterbury dies in 1240 on November the 16th, and he is born, he is born on November the 20th, which is the date that St. Edmund the King dies. So the two get connected. Um, Edmund's parents, uh, Mabel and um, Reginald, are living on St. Edmund's Lane, England. And on the day of Edmund's uh, birth, as he's delivered, it is a stillbirth. A stillbirth is uh, not being born alive. He's dead. And for all practical purposes, he would be buried. But his parents, Mabel and Reginald, decide they're going to baptize him. And the minute they start pouring the water on him, he comes to life. So here he is uh, now uh, a new child. And uh, we'll find that uh, Reginald and Mabel name him Rich Protector is the name of meaning behind his name, Edmund. And his mother is, uh, uh, historians give her uh, a rather interesting play and it's well worth just studying her life. Mothers are very much uh, an influence on, on uh, their children, obviously. And Mabel was certainly not remiss in being the protector, a rich protector of her children's faith and even her spouse. And uh, she lavishly uh, goes to some lengths to protect not only her own faith uh, and spiritual life, but that of her children. And uh, it shouldn't surprise us to learn that all of her children, uh, Edmund, her first son, Robert, her second, they become priests and her two daughters, Margaret and Alice become nuns, and even her husband, uh, and that must have been some marriage, because near the end of his life, he uh, becomes a monk. So that brings us uh, to uh, around his childhood, Edmund's childhood. It's rather interesting to think about um, the early education that young people had back in Edmund's time. When he was around 12 years old, um, he went to Oxford, nearby Oxford, uh, and it was quite a city in that time, uh, 
around 8,000 young boys from age 20, uh, 12 to 20 uh, were there to attend, uh, we'd call them colleges and universities. It was back in the time when Oxford and the University of Paris were just beginning. So we're talking about um, universities and institutions of higher education uh, in their very early days. And um, when you look at what was going on with those young people that were coming to Oxford, uh, and Edmund was among that group, uh, you notice that they were very wild, many of them. Uh, Mabel, uh, Edmund's mother, uh, ha had sent with him a hair shirt. And uh, uh, I, we have a hair shirt in the archives of the Edmundites. Uh, I don't think it's um, Edmund's, uh, but it certainly was one of the Ed early Edmundite members. But he, uh, he had that to wear, and it certainly reminded him to keep out of trouble. Um, but he certainly focused his life on being there for an education and not there uh, for being a wild uh, hooligan. Um, while he was at Oxford as a young person, he was only about 10 or 12. Um, he, the, there's an account uh, in his biogra uh, the bio biographical sketch of his life gives us a sense that uh, one day, as he was walking along, he, uh, alone, he encounters um, a Christ-like figure. And this Christ-like encounter influenced him for the rest of his life and it influenced him in a way that um, he obviously built up a deep relationship with the Lord and with children whom he took very much under his wing to educate. And um, as the story unfolds, he, he develops not only his relationship with the Lord by tracing on his forehead each night uh, the letters of Jesus' name, um, but also uh, he develops a, a strong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, nearby, uh, the University of Oxford has part of its campus, I guess, um, St. Mary's Church, and this church had uh, a beautiful statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as Edmund's devotion increased, he, he goes to his spiritual confessor and he wants to discuss with him this idea of making a promise, a promise to remain pure all the days of his life. So he purchases two rings, two rings, and he places one on his finger and one on the statue of Mary's finger as a sign of his promise to be pure all the days of his life. And he also goes uh, to the extent of uh, asking her uh, to, you know, to safeguard that pledge uh, with her intercession. So uh, he goes up to remove the ring because he doesn't want to get into trouble, I guess, with the, the local pastor. I'm not sure of that part of the story but he apparently cannot remove the ring. And so the ring stays on the hand, and for over 200 years, people were able to go to St. Mary's Church on the campus of Oxford and see this statue with the ring of Edmund on it. And it was only because of the uh, reform of Henry VIII where people were smashing statues that the um, ring disappears. As he continues his studies and completes them, he um, returns um, to Oxford uh, to, to, to get um, his, his degree in, in mathematics and dialectics. And he returns to Oxford as rather an extraordinary professor. Uh, you can't help but see how ahead of the curve he was in some ways. Uh, he's ahead of the curve uh, as far as introducing Aristotelian uh, philosophy into the curriculum of the university. And so here he is, uh, he is teaching dialectics uh, that are very much borrowing on heavily upon the classical philosophies of, the to uh, of antiquity. And um, uh, incorporating them into the theology of the time. His dialectics uh, is very much into probing the truth. And God knows we need uh, 
someone that could help us ascertain the truth in our own time. But um, as people reflected upon Edmund, uh, who were his colleagues, they, he really stood out. And one, one of the biographers talks about in his day he, how he stood alone. Uh, he was unra- uh, unrivaled. He was, uh, the, uh, one person describes him as the master pre- preeminent in whom other people, other scholars turned to him. And no one wanted to differ from what Edmund said. So he was not just simply another teacher. He was an extraordinary uh, teacher and somebody that uh, was well-respected. The other thing that um, uh, is rather striking is, uh, again, the influence of his mother. His mother, Mabel, apparently, he has a dream. And in that dream, he sees uh, his mother pleading with him to... uh, not use, not be obsessed with teaching symbols from trigonometry and geometry and all of the math that he was teaching, but be concerned and focus on the symbols of the Trinity. So he goes back to Paris to study theology, and there he uh, completes his theological uh, studies, and he ultimately is ordained and returns to Oxford again. This time he is going to Uh, teach theology. And um, if I could just, uh, again, borrow some of the thoughts that we find from reading histories of his life, he is an individual that as he is a professor of these students, when he sees someone who's struggling and in need, he really responds to them. He is the type of person uh, that one uh, biographical sketch just describes him selling his books his scholarly books, which were obviously expensive items, in order to, um, and even his clothes, some of his clothes, in order to help his needy students. And uh, it's around this time, as he is teaching theology and working with his students, uh, that people are approaching him for spiritual direction, and um, especially religious of his time. And so he he writes what is called the mirror, um, he, he uh, is fascinated with trying to present to readers our spiritual quest for perfection. He said, if you want to be holy, there are two things you need. You need to know the truth and you need to love goodness. So knowing the truth and loving goodness and... Um, Well, how do you do that? What's required? Well, self-knowledge is required and your love of neighbor. And those are going to be aided by the amount of prayer you invest each day and your meditation. And um, when you look back and you study the spiritualities that have evolved over the centuries, um, we talk about the percative, illuminative, and unitive way Edmund was, his mirror does a wonderful job of helping us appreciate that. He, he develops it along kind of these lines. He, he talks about Jesus shows us the way to rid ourselves of sin. That's the purgative way. Jesus also shows us uh, by, uh, through the light of truth, by what he teaches us, the illuminative way. And he unites us with God uh, ultimately, and that's the unitive way. So... Uh, he's completed this uh, work to help us strive for perfection. And uh, his, his whole thought process, I think, has convinced him that someone's good character, our good character ultimately is going to be the thing that builds God's kingdom. And um, he kind of lives his entire life as that being his focus. So what did Edmund see as the perfect life? Live humbly with regard to yourself. Live amicably with regard to your neighbor. And live honorably with regard to God. So we have, we have that three, threefold facet, and it plays again in, uh, you know, how do you achieve that in life? Well, that obviously requires uh, some kind of rigorous self-searching 
And uh, you have to recognize you have a need for God. You can't kind of have that uh, pride-filled attitude. Uh, and we must recognize our need, obviously, for conversion and transformation. Uh, just about this time, he's being spotted to be um, named to be the treasurer and overseer of the Salisbury Cathedral. Now, what's going on, I think, in his mind is he realizes you cannot build a church of stone until you've built the church of God within yourself. So here he is with, these, with this very spiritual perspective on life, and he's appointed the treasurer and overseer in Salisbury. And um, the construction started about two years before he arrives, and it really is going to take up to, uh, I guess it took 38 years to finally complete the building of the Salisbury Cathedral. We know he must have been a shrewd businessman because he's able to uh, raise enough funny, uh, money to build uh, the choir of the church, which is absolutely extraordinary to view. The Salisbury Cathedral, when you pull up the photographs for it, you realize uh, very quickly that this is early English architecture in the very best sense of that word. Uh, it has the small, uh, tallest church spire in all of the United Kingdom. Uh, when you go there, you'll see it has uh, one of the world's oldest working clocks, and it is uh, the place where one of the four original Magna Carta copies are stored and can be viewed. And uh, it's an extraordinary place to visit. What an incredible place to serve uh, and to be part and parcel of this incredible piece of the church. And yet, while he is at Salisbury, he is assigned to be the local pastor of a very small rural parish. I usually mispronounce it. I believe it's correctly pronounced Calm. You would think that, you know, having the amazing role that he played in Salisbury, this would be too little for him. But he, he delighted in it, and he really showed concern for the needy uh, of the countryside. He's noted for his generosity and, <coughs> and charity, uh, and he is particularly concerned about showing mercy and compassion. Um, that mercy and compassion gets played out in, his, in the work of the mirror. Um, one of his uh, nice quotes, I think, just gives you a sense of the man's commitment to the works of ch of mercy and his extraordinary uh, capacity for compassion. <clears throat> he says this in his mirror, it's better, it's better to have mercy and compassion for another's misery than to be able to give the whole world to the poor. In other words, it's not about things, not about things at all. Uh, for what you are, what you are is incomparably better than what you have. Incredibly better than what you have. For if you give yourself, you give more than the whole world. That's, I, I think that is one of my favorite uh, parts of his writings. Um, the other one is, don't be possessed by your possessions. Um, but that's a feel for the man, and you can see how it, his words play out his life. Um, he obviously is being recognized in Rome by Pope Gregory IX, and uh, he's a gifted preacher. So he is made the papal preacher of the Sixth Crusade. Gregory is obviously impressed with this uh, Edmund, 
And as he looks upon Edmund, he sees him as a worthy candidate to be proposed as the 40th Archbishop of Canterbury. And he inherits uh, the tensions of his time. The king is at odds with his barons uh, because he has, he's relying upon French in his administration. Uh, he also is uh, having problems because he's not following the Magna Carta. Edmund took as his um, uh, gospel, so to speak, each, each person when they're consecrated a bishop um, chooses a particular motto. Edmund chose to enter heaven enriched. It's very much reflected in the mirror when he quotes St. Bernard saying, uh, the blessed poor have nothing on earth and the rich have nothing in heaven. Thus the rich, if they desire heaven, ought to purchase it from the poor. So he's, uh, uh, even as an uh, archbishop, he's very focused on uh, poverty and living simply. Um, and although uh, he was successful initially with uh, arbitrating King Henry the, the III with the barons, uh, he finds himself very much at sea with uh, the clergy and his chapter monks, and they're always quarreling and feuding over his authority. With those um, irreconcilable differences that are there, the tensions that are there, he sets out in 1240 uh, to go to Rome to consult the Pope. And if you look at a map of uh, from uh, how you would travel from London to Rome, you notice that you go through France and you would, uh, following the roads you would take, you would go to the Cistercian Abbey in Pontigny, France. It was there that Archbishop uh, Thomas Becket spent some of his time in exile. Uh, but it was a frequent stopping off place uh, for those that would travel to Rome. And Edmund uh, fell seriously ill and so he couldn't continue his, his uh, travel to Rome. And not only does he not travel on to Rome, he decides to return to England. And as he is making his way back to England, his illness worsens to the point that he dies at the Augustinian Priory of St. James on November the 16th. And in accord with his wishes, he asks that he be buried not in England, but in Pontigny. And so his body is brought back to Pontigny and it arrives on his birthday, the feast of Edmund the King. Uh, almost immediately, uh, miracles are uh, attributed to him. And in June of 1247, the abbot of the Pontigny uh, Abbey has completed a beautiful shrine that will now encase the body of Edmund. And as they open the temporary, what had been the uh, tomb of Edmund, they discovered that his body was not decomposed in any way and that it was completely sound and intact as it was the day it was buried. Um, if you um, come to Enders Island, you can see um, his right arm is a relic, um, and it is uh, there to venerate and to uh, pray uh, for Edmund's intercession. His final words as he is dying at the Augustinian Priory uh, are the words that, um, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. The words that Jesus utters from the cross uh, are his own prayers. So Edmund's life is, is one of uh, really a beautiful uh, tribute to uh, his own faith and his own engagement with people of bringing them f their full uh, dignity as human persons under God. The final thing I think uh, to note about his life, uh, he has a beautiful prayer. It used to be part of a shrine at St. Michael's College uh, it's now the wonderful illumination that Jed Gibbons did of a prayer. Um, you can request a copy of it from our office. Uh, we also 
uh, have a beautiful hymn uh, called O Beate Mi Edmunde. And that, those words were written by Cardinal Wiseman, who uh, after the Anglican Church uh, became established in, in Great Britain, um, Cardinal Weissman became the uh, head of the Roman Catholic Church in England and the head seat for Ca Roman Catholics shifted to Westminster. And his uh, wonderful uh, song that he wrote honoring Edmund is something that Edmundites usually sing on the feast of St. Edmund. I thank you for your attention and hope God will bless you and St. Edmund will intercede for you.